the usual rules apply. So um, if you have questions during the course of the talk, you should put them in the chat. Uh, there'll be active discussion there. And if anything needs to be brought to Paul's attention, then, then uh, we can do that. Otherwise, at the end of the talk, we'll allow everyone to unmute themselves and join together in applause. And then uh, questions, we'll have a short break, and then we'll start the second talk, uh, Michelle Penn. OK, so Paul will be speaking to us today about log correlated fields in random matrix theory and analytic number theory. And I'll let him start. Thank you very much, Ivan, uh, for the organization and uh, to all, all the organizers, actually, for this wonderful initiative. Um, the um, topic of my talk today is logarithmically correlated fields. Um, in, a, in a very hands-on manner, I want to find specific models for which I can prove logarithm correlations in some sense. And these models will come from random matrix theory and analytic number theory. Okay. And uh, this talk really is a survey in some sense. I, I will just have a, give a personal overview of what can be done. Um, and uh, I will focus on um, really proving logarithmic correlations. Uh, but this has quite a few applications or further directions. For example, Wipia Argan has been talking about uh, maxima of logarithmically correlated fields in the context of the Riemann zeta function at this seminar, the one more probability seminar a few months ago. Um, and I, I may come a little bit back to that by the end of the talk, but I'm not sure I will have time anyway. So let me start. What, what do you see on this picture? Um, where my uh, mouse here is now is uh, the determinant of a Gini matrices, of a Gini matrix. So it's a n by n matrix with independent complex Gaussian entries. And if you plot the determinant divided by its expectation, you have this kind of landscape here. Um, this is for capital N equals 1,000. And um, I want to argue that there are some uh, similarities with other problems. Um, for example, a fun problem is do that in Mathematica. You take the Riemann zeta function very high along the critical axis say one half plus is, where s is of order 10 to the six. And you obtain this kind of graph here. And um, I want to argue that uh, both of these models are correlated. Okay, so the values you observe on both, it's not appearing now, but in dimension two or dimension one, they are correlated. So what is the correlated field? Uh, for, for me, um, we will have very practical examples, but one way to express the general setting is that you have a sequence of metric spaces, which are embedded, V1, V2, and so on. You have a common distance D on all of them. And uh, you want to build stochastic processes uh, depending on some index N, um, Xn on Vn, such that the, let's take them centered. And we want the covariance to be basically like the logarithm of the inverse distance. Of course, if you if you want to 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 talk about um, finite objects here, uh, you need to add a small cutoff. Let's call it one over n, so that uh, each one so that the random variables on the diagonal, uh, the covariance on the diagonal is finite. So first thing you can observe from this kind of, of definition is that there is a very slow decay of correlation because you have this logarithmic term. Uh, Typically, um, for complex systems, uh, the easy cases are when you have some level decay of correlations. Um, here, it, we are very far from that. Um, but still, we want to argue that there is a lot of universality and common techniques for many models which exhibit this kind of structure. Um, where, where does this kind of model come from? Well, typically, it comes from a setting where you have a superposition of, let's say, random waves or independent fields on different scales. Uh, some of them are, are very small scales, other ones very large. And one way to, and when you add all of them up, quite often you get this logarithmic term. One way to prove it is to use this fun formula for the logarithm. Uh, if u is a positive number, the log of u is equal to this integral here. For the integrand, the dependence on u is only in the second exponential term. Basically, what this tells you is that it's a superposition of processes which live on scale square root t. And uh, it's a superposition over t. 
Um, this formula is actually quite useful uh, if you also want to prove that it's really a covariance. Let's let's look at the, the easy, easy setting when where I forget the cutoff and I want to prove that in the limit, just a pure log term is a covariance. Okay. Well, you need to check positivity of um, the kernel integrated with respect to a test function. So you really pick your favorite fu smooth functions f and g. You take minus the double integral of, um, oh, uh, there's a typo here. The, I wrote f and f on each of these equations. It should be f and g. But anyways, you can, you can do it for f and f if you want. By polarization, it's fine. Um, and if you use this formula for the log, for the, log the dependence in u is only on the second term. The, the first term will, will amount to 0. And then you end up with a double integral with respect to a Gaussian kernel. You have a convolution of a function with a Gaussian. If you, go, if you apply Parseval and go to Fourier space, Fourier of the convolution is a product of Fourier, and you end up with the integral of the f hat square and the Fourier transform of a Gaussian, which fortunately is positive because it's himself. Um, so, so this log correlated field really makes sense. All right. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Uh, I forgot to say, but uh, as Ivan mentioned at the beginning of the talk, you should really feel free to uh, interrupt me in some way, which he uh, recommended, which is just to go to the chat and uh, ask me to stop, for example. Um, so some motivations for this field. There has been a lot of motivation um, stemming from a paper uh, in the early 2000s, I think, by Carpentier and Le Dussal, who argue that there are many common features for all uh, energy landscapes of disordered systems which exhibit this recreation structure. Um, Another motivation is uh, in the specific case when V is Rd, but most, more specifically R2, if you renormalize properly the exponential of the locorated field, you end up with a so-called Gaussian multiplicative chaos or a Gaussian multiplicative chaos, which has been shown by many, for example, uh, let's say uh, Vargas uh, and Rod and uh, many others that it has been proved to be the building block of uh, one building block of rigorous theory of you will quantum gravity. Um, for me, another motivation is really that it serves as a playground to push the rigorous analogies between random matrix theory and number theory. Um, we will show in the next uh, slides, like in 15 minutes, some works by Selberg and Diakonis Shashahani um, about this. And the fourth point here is that there is some universality for the created fields uh, that is expected at the level of the extremes, for example. Uh, what you expect is that there are always constants a n and b n, such as the maximum of your local related field will be of order a n plus b n um, times lambda. If you play with the parameter lambda, there should be a scale b n so, so that it converges in distribution. And the limiting random variable is supposed to be a randomly shifted gumball. This z is a random variable. Actually, some university of this type has been proved by Ding, Roy, and Zaytuni in 2015. In the case of Gaussian uh, local related fields uh, on RD. Uh, so this slide is really an exercise. Uh, but um, let's go back to basics. Um, if you if you have independent Gaussian, say, I pick them with variance one half. It's just convenient for my scales in the future of this talk. Um, and you want to find the size order of the maximum. Well, of course, you just use independence. The maximum smaller than lambda is just like all of them being smaller than lambda. And you split by independence. You tailor expand the Q of the Gaussian. You get a formula here. and I, this was for variance one half. Now I want to take a variance which is one half of log n because I want to compare with log related fields. And on the diagonal, I have a log n. Uh, so in that case, what, what you should remember for the rest of this talk is that the maximum is what you obtain is log n minus a quarter of double log n plus some random variable which converges in distribution to a gamble. Not a randomly shifted gamble, but um, just one gamble. Um, 
Okay. Examples. The canonical example of a local radiative field is a branching brain motion. I don't need to remind to the audience what branching brain motion is in details. It really is, uh, I'm putting my brain motions here, I normalize to a variance one half at time one. And um, I put an exponential clock on my first brain motion that starts at time zero. When the clock rings, it splits into two independent brain motions and so on and so on. Each brain motion lives its life with this clock and split process. Um, and uh, it's, re it's really uh, a wonderful thing that McKean has connected this to the fischer kolmogorov petrovsky uh, piskunov equation, the FKPP. And he found some analog of feynman catch representation for a solution of here one specific PDE, this FKPP. The DTU is the Laplacian plus a nonlinear term U square minus U. And so what McKean found is that the probability that the max of all of these trajectories of branching brain motion at time t is smaller than x is the solution of this equation when you start with the step initial condition. Um, so this has stemmed um, a lot of interest uh, in the 70s, 80s for really fine studies of the maximum of this um, branching brain motion. You see the the number of brain motions that you end up at time t is of order exponential t. So if you do a Gaussian calculation like before, and each one has variance t over two, the, my, calculate, my Gaussian calculation from before tells you that if they were independent, the maximum will really be of order t minus a quarter of log t. In fact, the maximum is linear, but Bramson has proved that the second order term is not what you get in the independent case, instead of a quarter of log t, it's a three quarter of log t. Of course, these brain motions are positively correlated because they share some common increment. So you expect that the maximum will be smaller than the, in the independent case because of this positive correlation. Okay. That was the first example. Second example is the 2D Gaussian free field. Um, in the discrete setting, I, I pick a box in Z2. Uh, let's say that we have uh, zero boundary conditions and the density uh, of uh, random variables indexed by the vertices is uh, this Gaussian density, which is exponential minus the sum of the squares of uh, for nearest neighbors, of the differences for nearest neighbors. So this is really a system of strings uh, which are nearest neighbors types. Um, if you want to understand the local related field for this model, actually starting with this explicit density is not such a good idea. Uh, the best way is to have a different representation saying that this actually corresponds to a uh, Gaussian uh, vector with covariance given by the green function here. So the expectation of the value at V times the value at V prime is equal to the expectation starting at V of how many times a, run, a standard random walk would visit V prime up to the moment it exits the box. And in dimension two, the logarithm is the inverse of the Laplacian. So for example, if you make a, a continuous approximation of this, you will find out that you need to have the log of the distance popping up, at least for V and V prime, which are in the bulk and not too close to the edge of the box. Um, so this is a local related field. Um, and the maximum uh, has been proved uh, more recently by Bramson, Ling, and Zaituni to converge in distribution after, under the same scale as previously for branching brain motion. You have this first term minus three quarter of the log of the first term plus some random variable, which here con converges in distribution to a shifted gamble. Okay, it's, it's a second canonical example. Now let's go to random matrix theory. Um, the story of history of, of um, central limit theorems in random matrix theory is, is really, really um, rich. Uh, I will not attempt to, to, to make a full list here. I want to, to distinguish a few categories of models for which we can prove central limit theorems for statistics related to eigenvalues. 
Um, one first work was when you pick your random matrix uniformly from compact groups. Uh, then Diakonis Shashahani and then Diakonis Evans have proved central limit theorems for the traces of the powers, and in particular for quite a few functions of, of, the, of the eigenvalues. If you go to the more general setting of uh, to a general setting of determinate point processes, in the 90s, there was an important work by Kostin and Lembovitz and then Soshnikov and many others. Um, what I will focus on in this talk is what I put in red here. Uh, I will try to explain a little bit more about the compact groups and then the 1D log gas on the circle with a seminal contribution of Kurt Johansson. And uh, another important set of results is about Wigner matrices. It has been proved by uh, Litova, Pastor, Shabina, and many others that linear statistics converge to Gaussians in some, with some covariance that we will discuss. More recently, there has been uh, works on 2D log gas, starting with Ryder Virag for the Gini brain sample, and they prove converges to the Gaussian free field, which, as we have seen, is a locurated field. Um, and then Amer, Hedelman, and Makarov in a more general setting. You can actually choose any temperature in dimension two for the log gas, and you still have convergence to a Gaussian free field. This was worked by Lovely Sarfati and then with Bauer Schmidt, Nicola, and Yao. Um, and you, there are plenty of questions you can ask also about the scales, for example, mesoscopic scales for Wigner matrices. Can you, can you prove the created field in, in some very small scale, almost microscopic? This was done by Lodia Sim, he and Nolos, and many others. And more recently, deformed Wigner matrices have been considered by Bausch, Schnelli, and Xu. But let, let's go to to example. I just want this lecture to, to, to really be about the method. So one of my favorite theorems on that setting is the strong Zigo theorem. Strong Zigo theorem tells you that if you pick a random unitary matrix of size n with eigenvalues exponential i theta case, and uh, you look at the linear statistics with respect to a nice, say, smooth function G, um, then the Laplace transform of these linear statistics converges to something quite explicit, actually converges very fast too, if G is nice. Um, and it converges to the following quantity. So you have exponential n times the first Fourier coefficient of G, which is nothing but the average of G on the circle plus the sum of k g hat k square, um, which is like the square of the h1 half norm, the uh, subordinate norm with parameter one half for the function g. So it really, this statement really means that the trace of g of your matrix uh, converges in low with no normalization to a Gaussian random variable. This lack of normalization is a remarkable fact. It really, highlights the lack of independence of the exponential i theta case and the fact that they repel each other. Um, I want to mention that this really means, this is really a statement about logarithmic correlations. Uh, why so? It's, a, it's an exercise uh, to show that the h1 half norm, or here the dot product associated, uh, it really is nothing but the integral of the product of the functions with respect to this log kernel. Um, okay, it's an exercise. I encourage you to try. Um, so I've stated the strong Zigo theorem in terms of unitary groups, like uh, expeditions for unitary groups. That's not the way it was proved first. Uh, it was first proved by Katch uh, and Zigo, and then Borodino Kunkov and many other proofs. Um, in the setting of uh, topless determinants, because it can be proved that this expectation on the left-hand side is nothing but a topic determinant, the one associated to the function exponential g. Um, there is a direct probabilistic proof by Kurt Johansson, and that's what I want to explain on the board. I'm a bit nostalgic of board talks, of course, and um, so I, I hope you can see. So let me go to the board, and I will try to explain what, what basically Johansson has done to prove this, this theorem. Okay, 
Paul, Paul, you need to unshare your slides. I uh, yes, I forgot the essential. That's right. Uh, how does this work? Okay. All right. So we are in the setting where we consider a Hamiltonian, which is given by the sum of log of distances between particles of the circle. Okay. And this is really um, the, uh, oh, I forgot the factor of two here, I guess. No, I k different from L. So um, this is this exponential HT really corresponds to um, just the density of the eigenvalues of a unitary matrix, okay? Um, but I perturb it by a factor of t times my linear statistics of interest. I call f the test function here, okay? And what we really want to calculate is this differential, is this expectation, which is the Laplace transform of my linear statistics. The way uh, Johansson calculates it is by interpolation in the parameter t. So you differentiate in t the slope of expectation. Naturally, you get the expectation of the sum of f, but for a new measure, the biased measure mu and t that I defined before. So that's my equation one. That's, that's just the start. Now let's forget it for one minute. And I will tell you about one equation, which is an exact equation called the loop equation. And it's very elementary to, to prove. Um, it's the following setting. I'm on the unit circle here. And I define the u to be the uniform measure on the unit circle, that's here. But I also have my points, which are the eigenvalues of my unit circle matrix. And I define the empirical measure to be d mu hat. Okay, it's not the expectation of the empirical measure, it's really the empirical measure. d mu hat, the empirical measure of my, uh, of my uh, eigenvalues that I recenter by d mu, so it's a signed measure. Then the claim is that there is, by integration by parts, there is a formula for the following quantity, and we will see that this is a pertinent one. If you can, you have a formula for the expectation on n times the following thing. Here, the function h is any nice function on the circle, which is, does not have to be related to f. So you take the double integral of the increment of h with respect to the cotangent kernel, and you integrate with respect to the signed measure on the one hand for one variable and the non-signed measure mu for the other variable. The claim is that this is equal. Oh, what is the signed measure? What is the mu tilde? Oh, um, yeah, I wanted to put a tilde here, not a hat. Thank you, Ivan. Oh, oh so the empirical measure, okay. Yeah, oh, this, this one is centered. I removed the mu. Uh, that was my mistake. I put a hat, I wanted to put a tilde here. Oh, okay, oh, so you subtract off the mu. Okay, so it's a signed measure, I see what you're saying. So here is really a tilde. And um, hat is without the tilde, is without the centering. So the new hat is one over n, the sum of delta zi. Um, so, so, so this thing is equal to minus t expectation of h f prime d mu hat. Now it's a hat. It's not a tilde, so it's not signed. Plus two terms, which are explicit, and I don't want to go into full details about them. The first term is, a, is the same as here, but instead of having mu tilde mu, I have mu tilde mu tilde. So it's supposed to be smaller because it's twice the same measure, which is supposed to be very small. If you, if you have a good air partition of the particles. Um, and then there is another term which is zero because we are on the circle and uh, the integral of the differential is zero. Okay, it's approximately zero. So why is this useful? Okay, I just give you a formula, well, who cares? It's because look at this term, 
uh, imagine, for example, you, you, you isolate one integral with respect to the cotangent curve. Remember that H does not have to be related to F. So the key is imagine to move the yes, no, now I need to turn. Thank you. So the key is imagine that your function f that was of interest initially can actually be written as a convolution of the increment of h with the cotangent kernel. Okay. If it can be written in this way, then this term here really is exactly what we want. It's nothing but the expectation of linear statistics of, um, of f for the measure mu and t. I forgot to specify that all of this expectation is for the measure mu and t. So Paul, in, on the right-hand side of your formula, you have a f prime in the first yes. term. Is that f prime the same as the f that you just introduced in step three? Uh, I start with an F here, which is the F I want to work with on the strong ego theorem, right? Oh, 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 I see. Because you're doing this with respect to mu t, mu t. Oh, yeah, yeah. There is an F here, you're right. There is an F in the mu t. Okay, I see. Okay. okay, so if you can invert and write F in this way, uh, then you're good because it's really. What it really gives you is that the expectation of the sum of f is nothing but minus t integral of h f prime plus something small. And now it happened that if you go to Fourier to solve this equation and find h depending on f, you will find that the integral of h f prime is nothing but the h one half norm uh, of, of your function. So that concludes the proof. So the key is, it, it, I mean, it's really on, on two boards here. Um, the key is to, to find this, to have this idea, of course, and then you need to be able to justify that the terms that I neglected here are really small, and this is based on rigidity of eigenvalues, basically. Okay, the fact that they really have, are very well sprayed on, on the CRP. Okay, but now this looks like a miracle. I want to argue that um, these proofs based on loop equations are somehow natural. So let me share my screen again. Um, there was a question about what is the T in the right hand side. I'm not sure what right hand side is. So it's good. It's maybe this one. Okay. If it is this one, it's a, uh, it's really the T from the mu and T. Remember I start with the expectation of the Laplace transform for argument T. Thanks. Okay. Now let's share my screen again. Okay, is is a viewing okay? All right. Yeah. Now I, I want I want to answer the question: Why does this work? Where does this come from? Okay. Uh, to explain that, it's actually easier to do it in dimension two. You can adapt the proof I mentioned on the circle to the Ginebra setting. Um, this is a difficult thing that uh, Amer, Hadelman, and Makarov have done, but the the, the heuristics there are simpler. So let me tell you about uh, 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 this theorem that I like a lot. So following Ryder and Virag, Hammer, Anderman, and Makarov have proved the following thing. If you take a, a log gas at inverse temperature two in dimension two, which is confined by a potential V to be on, on a nice set of the complex plane, then you may ask about the analog of the strong zero theorem what is the Laplace transform of the linear statistics of, a, of some test function f? I take f supported in the bulk of the spectrum. It makes life much easier here. Um, so they prove that it converges to the Gaussian free field, to a Gaussian random variable with covariance, with variance given by the integral of the gradient square. I want to explain why, just in two equations. Um, first of all, imagine you have a particle in your droplet and it's at equilibrium. What it means is that the force which is related to the potential V needs to be compensated by the force coming from the other particles. So what you expect is that at equilibrium, the measure, the equilibrium measure mu V 
will be such that the Euler Lagrange equation is satisfied, meaning that the integral of d mu v over z minus w, z minus w is a differential of a Hamiltonian so that the force related to the log interaction. This needs to be equal to dv of z. Okay, so it's really it's really a matter of force, right? So the one coming from v needs to be compensated by the other ones at leading order. On the other hand, there is a, a nice equation is that a function g is always in dimension two equal to the integral of its anti-holomorphic derivative divided by z minus w. And this equation is the same, actually is the same thing as, setting, as saying that the log is the inverse of Laplacian in dimension two. Just by integration by parts, that's, that's just the same statement. If you look at these two equations, what does that suggest? Well, that suggests an easy formula for the equilibrium measure mu v, right? It suggests that mu v is nothing but the Laplacian of v. Because if you, if you plug dv in for g here, you end up with this. Okay. So typically, the equilibrium measure will be given by the Laplacian of v. Um, but now, what, what has Johansson been doing? In, in the proof that is still on my, on my back here on the board, what happens is you, you calculate, you, you reduce the problem of Laplace transform to a problem of density of states, just a one point function, but for a perturbed measure. This is really what it is. So imagine that actually the one point function, so this mu v, react in a linear way when you perturb V, then it actually gives you the heuristics behind your answer. So my, my, the claim here is really that the loop equation technique for that purpose is nothing but a quantification of the earlier Lagrange equation, which allows to state that the density of states responds linearly to potential perturbations. And as a consequence, if it's linear at the level of the log Laplace transform, or, or its derivative, it means that the runner variable are Gaussian. Okay, so it's really this linear response which is responsible for Gaussianity. At least from that proof. Um, so this works very well when you have smooth linear statistics. Okay, for example, I need this formula here for G of Z, which requires G to be C2, probably something like this. Um, what if what if you don't have you're not in such a setting? For example, a lot of interest is about the determinants. So let's consider singular statistics. For example, for the unitary group, look at the determinant of your unitary matrix, the characteristic polynomial evaluated at x. So there, are, there have been many, many works, starting with um, for example, there is a work of uh, Keating, O'Connell, and, and others, uh, proving that you have convergence to a log correlated field in after, for this object after integration with respect to some smooth uh, random variables. But you may ask, is this one really uh, Gaussian after taking the log, for example? So something from my thesis, which is a simple consequence of a theorem that we will see after, is that if you take eigenangles, which may depend on n, um, which scale like a power of n, and you evaluate your log characteristic polynomial for your unitary matrix at these eigenangles, then you always have convergence to a Gaussian vector. And the covariance really depends on the log of the distance between the phi's, is this constant c i j. You take the log of the distance and you divide by log n, and that's the covariance. So, so this theorem basically says that it's a log correlated field, even when you look at the singular observable direct. Okay. Um, but the, the important thing is how do you prove that? Well, it really goes back to Diakonis and Shashahani, who have explicit formulas for the moments of traces of unitary matrices based on representation theory. And one consequence of it that was stated uh, by Diakonis and Evans is 
that if you look at the last line here, if you take a sum of a linear, a linear combination of those powers of traces, of the traces of the powers, um, with arbitrary coefficients, which may depend on n, then you always have convergence to a Gaussian problem, just provided some, some conditions, which are quite weak on the tail, for example, on the tail of, of, the, of these coefficients, the L2 norm of the tail of this coefficient, something like this. Uh, and this is very easy to, to check in practice. And in the case of the log of the determinant, you just expand the log of one minus epsilon in traces, and uh, this actually applies. And uh, you can just prove the multidimensional version based on this here. But my point is, uh, there is no loop equation in that setting. It really relies first on explicit formulas by Diakonis and Shashahani. Okay, let's go to number theory. So here is the object of interest. The zeta function, it has two different types of writings. Uh, for the real part of S greater than one, it can be written as a Dirichlet sum or an Euler product, which is a product over primes. It has an analytic continuation to the full plane except at one. This continuation admits um, some symmetry, uh, the, uh, the uh, functional equation here. And this is just a graph of the inverse of zeta so that you can uh, appreciate how well the zeros seem to be aligned. Uh, so what is this graph? So this graph is um, just something you can do for fun. You pick many values of zeta at random points on the critical axis. You take the log and you make a plot on the complex plane. Well, it's not so far from a Gaussian. And that's in fact the motivation for doing this experiment. It's Selberg had proved it's a Gaussian. Um, it's a famous theorem from 1946. He did not state it as a central limit theorem. He just calculated moments and he got formulas and never eventually commented that it's Gaussian. Um, so the theorem tells you that if you pick a random point along the critical axis between height zero and capital T, then it converges to a Gaussian, the log of zeta converges to a Gaussian, provided you normalize by a square root of one half of double log t. So I promised in this talk to give a, a few techniques for proving block related fields, including in our series. So I want to explain how you prove this. Okay. There are two key steps. The first step is to cut the tail in the Euler product. So, from, from the definition of zeta here, you may, there are two ways to start, right? You can start with this or with this. The problem is that these are defined only for real part of S greater than one. But we will see in a minute how to overcome this problem. But imagine you can take the log in the, if, if, you, if you consider the log, of course, it's a better idea to look at the other product. You pick the log and then this, these primes diverge. So, you tailor expand the log of one minus epsilon. And it gives you a, an approximation for the log of zeta in terms of partial sums of primes to some phases divided by square root because we are on the critical axis. Now, how many primes do you need to pick? Well, if you go up to capital T, I'm sorry that this small t here should be a capital T. Um, then in, in, L, in L2 sense, Selberg has proved that this is uniformly bounded in capital T. So because of this bound and we have an extra normalization in the CLT, it means that we only need to prove the CLT for this partial sum. Okay. And now for this partial sum, the key is to quantify the fact that the primes to these powers, they behave like independent random variables on the circle. If you pick, let's say two to the minus is and three to the minus is, and you pick s at random in a larger and larger interval, then it's very easy to prove by the method of moments that it converges to independent random variables. What is not so easy is when, when you take more and more primes diverging with the capital T. 
we will come back to that. But basically, the idea is to prove that you have this expectation of the product of powers of primes, uh, which is the same as the expectation for uniform on the, on the CIP. So the second step in that setting is not too hard, actually. But there is a nice idea to have for the first step. And I want to mention how Selberg proceeds. As I mentioned, the other product is not valid on the, on the critical strip. So how does Selberg proceed? Uh, there is a formula um, which goes back to Landau, but it's really one sample of the so-called explicit formula of Riemann and others which tells you that the, for any point, zeta prime over zeta can be written as a combination of two terms, essentially. So the first term is a sum of a primes. So this delta of n, uh, that's the von Mangold function, is a function which is equal to log p when n is the power of p, of a prime p, and otherwise it's zero. So it's, a, it's a, some arithmetic content here. And essentially, this sum is supported on primes. Um, so you have this sum plus some term which happens to be always small and the last one small too, but you have a combination of primes and zeros. These rows here are the zeros of this Riemann zeta function. And this is a formula which is true for any x. It's a fun fact, by the way, because the left-hand side does not depend on x, but no, and the, this term makes jumps in x. So, so this term here needs to make jumps in x. How could it be? Uh, but, well, it's because it's not absolutely summable. Uh, and that's why it can have a very strange behavior. It really needs to be understood as a sum from right and left with some cutoffs. Um, so this formula is very hard to use in practice. What you, of course, what you would like to do is to integrate zeta prime over zeta. In this way, you end up with the log of zeta and you express it in terms of some arithmetic content and you want to prove everything else that does not matter. So the good idea of Selberg was the following one. There is another formula which consists in smoothing this cutoff a little bit. And that's enough to actually make this term much more easy to handle. So the good idea of Selberg was to introduce a, a, a smoothing of the von Mangold function which was coinciding with von Nogold on some interval and then interpolating with zero on a further interval. And when you do that, the zeta prime over zeta is a, is a, is a, a arithmetic content type of sum plus some small terms. And this one now, the, the hard sum over zeros, now you have a square down there. It's because you have been smoothing the cutoff that the explicit formulas uh, give something smoother here. And this can be handled as a consequence. There are some further ideas to get, but this is the main idea. Um, okay, so we understand why, why we have Gaussianity behind zeta. Now, why is it log correlated? I mentioned a result for one point. You may ask, what about two points? Where does the log correlation come from? Well, from, from what I said, what we really need to consider is SK of H, which, which is a sum of these terms for primes up to T. Okay, that was Selberg theorem that you, you only need to consider this sum to understand the, the, the Gaussianity. So at the level of this sum, what you can do is to, to cut the full sum into some blocks. So blocks are on exponential scale for the log of primes. The reason I choose this, um, these scales is because with this normalization, with, with these scales, um, each increment really has the same size order. This is because the sum of inverse of primes up to t is a double log of t. Um, okay, so, so we have this kind of random walk representation of the final value of zeta. And it happens that of course, if, if you have two H's, H1 and H2, H and H prime, which are very close, the increments will be common, but when, they are, when, they, when you have increments which are a bit further, the increments will be essentially the same up to some primes and then they will be different. 
So essentially, they would be the same as long as the distance between h and h prime is smaller than exponential l, the index on the, of the increment. And then they become essentially zero. So there is a branching structure behind, behind these increments. And this branching gets back to the branching brown motion uh, setting, and uh, that's why it's not correlated. Um, how much time do I have left, Ivan? So you could go another 10 minutes or so. OK, great. So I have time to, to state a little bit about maxima. So I, as I mentioned, uh, Louis Pierre gave a talk uh, a few months ago about the maximum in, in such settings. Um, I, I, I will uh, have a, a small overlap with what, with what he said. Okay. Um, let me remind you this uh, conjecture by Fyodorov, Harry, and Keating. Um, that's uh, what started my motivation for study of local related fields in, um, at the level of extrema for random matrices and, and, and Riemann zeta function. So they consider, on the one hand, this unitary matrix model, and on the other hand, zeta. And the, the initial goal was really to understand, well, the, the hard question in number theory for these types of extreme equation is to understand the global maximum of zeta up to some level. What is the asymptotics of the global maximum? There are many estimates, but there is no consensus about what a good conjecture should be about it. The reason, one reason is that random matrix is a good model for zeta if you look at local things. But for, for global observables, it's not so clear. Paul, is that the Lindelof conjecture, essentially? Or? Yeah, so Lindelof tells you that uh, this maximum of uh, zeta should be at most t to the epsilon for any t if you go up to high t. Under the Riemann hypothesis, you can actually lower this t to the epsilon to something smaller. And there are some lower bounds which have been proved also uh, by uh, Sunararajan and Bonarenko and, and Saip and others. Um, but um, in between, there is room for what a good conjecture should be, and it's not so clear yet. Um, so if you look at this maximum of log of zeta, they conjecture that. Well, what they did is let's randomize the problem because it's too hard. So they, instead of looking at the maximum globally, they take the maximum on a, on a size on a window of size order one. This size order is actually natural for some reasons I may, I may mention before or later. You pick a size order one window and you wonder about what is the maximum there. So it's a random variable, this maximum. What is little t? Should that be big T? Uh, that should be big T again. Thank you, Ayan. And this maximum is supposed to behave like, a, like the local related uh, family, what we have seen is you have a leading order term minus three quarter of its log plus a random variable which supposedly is in the shifted Gumbel, Gumbel family. In particular, it, it has a tail which is of this type. Um, but the way, they, the way they obtained the conjecture was not by uh, doing the local relation uh, analogy with branching Moran motion they obtained the analogous conjecture for random matrix by a method of moments. Uh, and then they argued that it should be a similar type of behavior. So one thing really wonderful about it is the data. If you think about it, you have a triple log T here. It's, it's completely insane to try to test it numerically. Uh, however, this insanity ends up working. Um, because they can go up to height, which is 10 to the 28 along the critical axis. And this is because uh, Gaith Hyrie, who is here, uh, is uh, the expert about numerical evaluation of the Riemann zeta function. So they go up to 10 to the 28. And uh, the data is a red curve. And what you get for the random matrix model, the conjecture for the random matrix model is a dotted curve. So it's not too far. Actually, it's not clear that they really should be coinciding, but they have the same type of state behavior supposedly, and, uh, and they are kind of not too far. And anyways, confirming the scale with a three quarter is already quite a, quite a remarkable thing. Um, so I think I will, Skip this slide. 
and just mention what, what has been proved on these things. Um, the best result by Shaibi, Najinad, and Madol, 2016, they proved that this maximum, in the context of a random matrix, um, really has the expecting first two leading order, and even more, what remains is tight. Uh, there were previous works by uh, Argan Belus and myself, and Paquette and Zaytouni for first and second order. And all of these results rely on the um, on the on applications of IDs developed for branching Bernard Uh I think I will not have time to go to, to Zeta. So I will just mention in for this result, uh, because Rupia has talked about Zeta anyway. So for, for this random matrix result, what kind of branching is there? And uh, what is the main idea behind Bramson's method? So let's go back to branching bra motion. Imagine you want to prove the maximum of branching bra motions. These are this x index v at time t. You want to prove it's of order t minus three quarter of log t. So in particular, you would like to prove that there is no bra motion higher than this, where bt goes to infinity arbitrarily slowly. The problem, of course, is uh, the first moment does not give the, you the right answer because uh, at the level of the first moment, you don't see correlations. It's just like for independent Gaussians. And for independent Gaussians, it's t minus a quarter of log t, so it diverges. So what, what you may want to do as a probabilist is to condition on some good event. For each, for each Brian motion, you condition on an extra event A index V which should be typical, but makes this expectation of the right order now. So the wonderful idea by Bramson is to find this event. And this event happens to be the fact that all of these Brownian motions in the branching Brownian motion should remain under some barrier, which is linear, plus some, some buffer. Uh, which, for example, could be chosen to be log of the t o square. So you, you have a barrier, and all of these trajectories should remain below. And it, uh, this is easy, easy to prove that it's a typical event, actually. But it's enough so that when you condition on it, you disregard, I mean, you, 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 you remove the divergence of the expectation coming from atypical events. So why is it so? Um, it's, a, it's a fun, um, uh, it relies on this fun and beautiful argument of Ballot type of theorem. What you need to calculate eventually, if you want to apply this with this, with this event, calculate this expectation under this event, you need to calculate the probabilities that the Brian motion, say a Brian bridge between two points, remain below a barrier, right? And if the, if the barrier is, is uh, just flat horizontal, which you, you can always um, consider in the case of Brown motion, just by change of variables, then this probability to remain below decays like one over T. It's actually M is times M minus P. This product of two terms is a distance from the endpoints to the barrier. The product of the distances divided by T. And this extra one over t actually is a reason why you go from a one quarter to one quarter in the maximum. Okay, it's it just a it's a beautiful um, argument by Bramson, which has been applied to many local related fields. So the branching structure behind Bram, behind random matrices. I will stop with this. This branching structure is just similar to what I explained for for zeta. Um, Diakonish Shahani tells us that you can calculate the expectation of traces of unitary matrices. And for different powers, they are always uncorrelated. And when you have the same power, the, the variance grows linearly in K up to some saturation at N. When you, in particular, the, the variance is of order k. So if you expand, Taylor expands the log of the determinant in Fourier series, this is what we did with Argan and Belus, 
and you package all of these increments uh, in to run variables which are of order one, and Dakonis Shashani tell us what is a good packaging that we should do here to get a variance of order one. Um, then you end up with a random walk representation for this for this log debt. And the increments for different ages will be the same up to some uh, bifurcation. And the bifurcation here will be given by the log of h1 minus h2. It's a natural thing because the difference between the h's needs to be much smaller. Uh, multiplied by j needs to be much smaller than one, basically. So that's exactly what, what you get. So that's the reason why it's, it's log correlated. And you can apply this, this uh, uh, barrier techniques of Bramson and so on. So I will not comment on uh, the recent work with Archimedes and Razivir on Zeta. Uh, I encourage you to see the, uh, I think the, the, talks are, the talks are recorded. So you can look at Louis Pilar's talk online for this. Um, and let me just conclude. Uh, so we have seen that the university class of rock related fields includes non-Gaussian models, uh, which are of interest to many for other reasons, uh, for example, unitary matrices and zeta. Uh, and there are essentially two ways to prove local relations in random matrix theory. Uh, two major ways, I would say, that my view. This loop equation or you have some type of technique. Um, it allows to treat some uh, proof of local relation in some average sense, like you, you pick a you pick a smooth function and you test the field with respect to this smooth function, and this gives you the local relation. If you want to, to do it for, for observables which are much more singular, like the log of the determinant, you, you need to rely on, on, uh, on some explicit formulas, for example, the moments of Diakonin Shashahani. The loop equation do, does not work directly. You can also rely on something I've not talked about, the sparse matrix models like Dumitri with Delman for it and so on. Um, so Michel's talk just after will actually give one model for which the loop equation can uh, prove local relation, even in the sense of uh, logarithmic singularities. Um, so for the maxima, the all proofs rely on branching structures. But I think I think this these questions about field of hierarchical conjectures are interesting uh, to me because they really are a good reason to push um, the knowledge of very high modes in random matrix theory and number theory. Like what, what happens for very large primes uh, with phases or the very large powers of of unitary matrices. Uh, there is a lot of motivation to understand these objects better. Uh, because of these conjectures. And uh, one question which is very natural after what I mentioned is, what about universality of extremes? We, I mentioned this result by Ding Roy and Zaytuni, the Gaussian case. Can you prove universality in an orthogonal direction? For example, um, when you have non-integrable random matrices. Uh, so I will stop here. Okay, uh, and I just enabled everyone to unmute themselves. So you'd like to join together in applause. I think I, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and so we have a little bit of time for questions and then we'll transition to Michelle's talk. If you have one, just unmute yourself. No questions? OK, maybe people need a, a, a momentary break. Um, so let's let's resume in in maybe four minutes at, uh, on my time, 10.05 for Michelle's talk. And uh, let's thank Paul again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. So Michelle, do you want to try sharing your slides now? Yes. Right, thanks, Paul. This is really good. Yes. Milton, you'll, you'll take over, Chair? Yes. Okay. 
Does it work? Yeah. So, um, pass one slide just to, to, to check that it also works. Okay, good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Uh, Well, I guess I haven't said it, but uh, when does uh, Michelle's talk start? Uh, uh, let's say, right? then, it's then, uh, twelve oh five. Okay. So, one, one more minute. All right. Thanks. Okay, so I think it's the time to restart. Uh, yes, in case you want to see the, the slides of, of Michel, there's a link on the chat. Uh, you can find it on his uh, webpage. And then, um, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Michelle Payne uh, from Current Institute, who is going to talk about the central limit theorem for the characteristic polynomial of general vector examples. So, uh, thanks for uh, the introduction and for the opportunity to give a talk here. So, um, I will talk about a joint work with uh, so with Paul and also with uh, Krishnan Modi, and which is also at uh, Current Institute. Um, so yeah, the topic will be uh, related to previous talks. So we will prove that uh, the logarithm of the characteristic polynomial uh, of general beta ensembles uh, behaves as a log correlated field. Okay, so uh, let's start. The first, what are uh, general beta ensembles? So that's also what is called uh, log gas uh, in uh, dimension one. So we have n particles, which are on the real line. So the positions are lambda one to lambda n. Uh, we suppose that a, pot a potential is given. So it's a function from R to R, which is uh, going to infinity at uh, infinity. And we consider the following uh, energy for, for a configuration. So first, uh, each particle independently of each other is affected by the potential. And then there are logarithmic interactions. So um, uh, then we, we pick a particle, 
uh, sort of particles at random according to the following Gibbs measure. So uh, proportionally to exponential minus beta times the, the Hamiltonian. Okay, so another way to, to write it is, uh, is uh, this way, which is uh, um, maybe familiar for, for uh, those doing a random matrix theory. Okay, so there are many particular cases. Uh, um, the most famous ones are, are uh, when the potential is quadratic and beta is uh, some value uh, uh, which is either, either one, two or four. In that case, uh, this, uh, this is the density of eigenvalues of uh, three random matrix models, which are Gaussian orthogonal ensembles the unitary ensemble and the symplectic ensembles, which are all uh, random matrices uh, filled with uh, ID uh, Gaussian entries up to some uh, symmetries, depending on the value of beta. Okay. Then uh, for general V, but still the same values of beta, it can still be seen as, as the eigenvalues of some uh, random uh, matrix which is uh, uh, okay, chosen also uh, with a certain symmetry depending on the value of beta, uh, but now uh, not, uh, not, with, with, not necessarily with Gaussian entries, it depends on the potential V. And uh, finally, another way to, to change this is to take the quadratic potential, but uh, let beta be any uh, positive number in that case, uh, we find the Gaussian beta ensembles. Uh, and these uh, Gaussian beta ensembles can also be seen as uh, random matrices, uh, which are represented uh, as three diagonal matrices. So matrices that have uh, ent non-zero entries only on the three central diagonals. Okay. In full generality, you cannot see uh, the lambda is as uh, eigenvalues of uh, a random matrix. Okay, so um, this is the, the, the model we're looking at. And uh, for this model, uh, the first thing we can say is that there, there is a, a law of large numbers. If you look at the, the empirical measure, um, then uh, it converges to some equilibrium measure. And this equilibrium measure um, can be defined as the minimizer of uh, this energy, which is uh, obtained as the limit of the of the of the Hamiltonian. And this equilibrium measure has a density uh, that I will denote by rho uh, ek, and uh, it's compactly supported. So one example is uh, if you take the quadratic potential then you find uh, the semicircle distribution as the equilibrium measure. Okay, maybe one thing which is uh, worth noticing is that this equilibrium measure does not depend on beta. Actually, the energy, the, the Hamiltonian does not depend on beta. And so this energy does not depend on beta, the equilibrium measure does not depend on beta. Okay. So now I can state uh, our assumptions. So first, we, we need to be uh, in the so-called one-cut regime, which is uh, the fact that the equilibrium measure, which has a compact support, but is compact, the support is, uh, is uh, connect, so it's connected. There, so okay. let's say it's a single interval, A, B. And uh, moreover, we need uh, another assumption, which is that the potential is regular in the following sense. Uh, the equilibrium measure, uh, so it's the density is non-zero inside the support. And uh, the behavior close to the edge is uh, the density vanishes as a square root. So here as a square root of b minus x, here as a square root of uh, x minus a. Okay. 
this is so this second assumption is not uh, very restrictive actually most of the potential uh, satisfy this uh, this assumption so the one that does not satisfy this assumption are, are called uh, critical um okay and then we we need uh, to assume that v is uh, analytic uh, in r so it can be extended to as an, an analytic uh, function uh, in a neighborhood of the real lane And finally, there are some uh, technical assumptions that I won't state uh, about just the behavior of the potential at infinity and of its derivative. Just everything should not behave too too widely. Michel? Yes? Just to have um, an example in mind, uh, do potentials like, uh, I don't know, x squared plus a constant x to the four or x squared plus sine of sine of x uh, satisfy these, uh, these assumptions? Um, so x squared plus, plus okay, x squared satisfy the, this assumption. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I can just come back here. That's, uh, yeah. that's this one. So you have the square root at both edges, the square root behavior, and it's uh, simply compacted. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, Compactly supported. Uh, most of the polynomials with, uh, will satisfy this assumption. So at least, okay, you, 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 v has to go to infinity, uh, to plus infinity at infinity. So let's say even uh, polynomials. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, almost all potentials, uh, I mean, okay. all, re all potentials you can uh, uh, Think of, oh, okay, no, not for the first one, for the one cut regime, this is the most restrictive, I would say, assumption. Um, yes. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, so our interest in this talk is to prove a central limit theorem for um, the logarithm of the characteristic polynomial. So, which is uh, this function, the sum over the eigenvalues of uh, the logarithm of e minus the, so the position of the particle, um, where for the log, okay, I take the, the principal branch of the log uh, extended to, extended to, to the negative axis from above. So it's continuous from above on the, Okay, I see uh, another question on the chat. Re regular or analytic? Regular, uh, okay. Uh, regular is the name for this assumption, which is, uh, uh, and then I assume that it's analytic. Okay, it's a weird name, I uh, agree. Uh, okay, it has nothing to do with uh, the fact of being smooth or whatever. It's really, th that's what it means to be regular. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, the real part of, of this, uh, this log is the log of the absolute value uh, of E minus uh, lambda K. So this is typically the log of the, the absolute value of the determinant of the matrix, if it's a random matrix model. Uh, okay. And the, the imaginary part, instead uh, you have no, uh, the, the, the behavior of the imaginary part of the log on the real line, actually it's simply a step function. It's equal to, to pi uh, up to zero, and then it's equal to zero on the, on the positive numbers. So the imaginary part of the characteristic polynomial is just a uh, counting function of the particles. So that's a good reason to, to study it, uh, just because uh, it contains a lot of information about uh, positions of the particles. And uh, so our goal uh, here is to study the asymptotic behavior of uh, these functions, so of this random variable. Um, so if you do nothing and you just plug in uh, the, the, this, uh, this function here, uh, actually it's the law of large number we, which, uh, which dominates. And so you have, of course, to recenter by the law of large numbers, so n times the integral of the log against the equilibrium measure. 
and then you see the fluctuations. Um, and uh, what we are going to prove is that uh, this uh, this random function here is a, a log correlated field. Okay. So before uh, state, stating our central uh, limit theorem, let's uh, state the result by uh, Johansson for uh, linear statistics. So let's say that now we consider any uh, sum over the, the particles of some function of the particle. Uh, and uh, if f is a let's say smooth function, then uh, Johansson proved that the linear statistic recentered by uh, the law of large numbers, so n times the integral against the equilibrium measure, converges to um, a normal distribution. This uh, the mean of the normal distribution is given by uh, this formula, which where okay the dependence in beta is uh, really simple, but the dependence in v is a bit uh, more so okay the measure is is explicit, but uh, there is a dependence in, in v here. But the interesting thing is that already here we can see universality because for the variance, okay there is this formula which is uh, okay I will comment more on it just after but. The one thing one can notice here uh, is that first the dependence in beta is really uh, also very simple, and the dependence in v, uh, okay, it's almost independent in v. It just depends on on a and b, but uh, okay, it's just a scaling factor. But otherwise, it's uh, it's universal. Okay, so this formula uh, you can compare it to the one we have seen in in Paul's talk for. Uh, um, Zegger theorem on the circle. Uh, it's the theory of k times uh, uh, Fourier coefficient of f squared. That's really the same type of formula. And this tells you already that uh, there is a, a, a log correlated uh, behavior behind. Okay, so this type of results. Uh, then the, it can be extended to what, what is called mesoscopic scale. So scales that are, so here it was macroscopic scale, f was a smooth function. Then one can consider a function f that uh, varies on scales that are uh, n to the negative s for s between zero and one. Uh, and then n to the negative one is really the microscopic scale, which is the scale, the typical distance between particles. So here you take a scale which is between macroscopic and the microscopic scale, which is the distance between particles. And uh, in that case, you can prove uh, still a similar theorem. So the, for, for uh, this type of beta ensemble, uh, there is a result by Beckerman and Lotia, but okay, there are uh, many other uh, results uh, dating back uh, at least to. Uh, this paper by Boutet, de Mauvel, and, and Kroonzi. Uh, okay, I, I won't cite all the, the results in this direction, but what I just want to say is that uh, the variance stays of order one in all these cases. And now what we want to do is to take F as the logarithm. So which is uh, not smooth and uh, not even uh, uh, a mesoscopic uh, scale varying function. So in that case, uh, so let's say that f is either the real part of the log of or the imaginary part of the log. Um, we look at the associated uh, statistic function, uh, statist linear statistic, we center it by the, the law of large uh, numbers, and we want to prove a CLT. So if we look at the formula given by uh, Johnson's theorem, then uh, these coefficients here, the Fourier coefficients uh, for both uh, of these functions, they are uh, for the one over k as k is large. So you see that this sum has to be infinite. If you just plug in like this, uh, this function or this function, the sum would be infinite. Um, Okay, the truth is that uh, actually the, the function f, uh, the, 
you can regularize it up to a scale one over n because one over n is the typical distance uh, between particles in the bulk. So okay, the fact that it's varying at scale one over n or, uh, or no scale at all, so a pure jump uh, like here uh, makes no difference. Okay, that's the, the hope. If you do that, then uh, in this, uh, in these Fourier coefficients, only the coefficients up to k, which is uh, of order n, will will be of this size. And so this series here uh, will be truncated at level n. And uh, this gives a variance of order log n. OK, so that's uh, uh, the the heuristics. So the, the central limit theorem is not true directly with this formula because it would give a plus infinity. It is true with this formula applied to some regularized version of n. Okay. So our result that I'm going to state now is a, a multidimensional central limit theorem for this quantity, this uh, function, taken at uh, so finitely many points, but uh, as many points as you want. Uh, anywhere in the spectrum. And uh, to get a central limit theorem, you need to rescale by square root log n. OK, so let's state uh, the results. Uh, so I will state it in different parts, uh, just to, okay, because there are different regimes. So first, OK, let's say we consider the central limit theorem at only one point. So um, this is uh, ln of e is the, the my log the logarithm of the characteristic polynomial we centered. If I take a point E, which is in the bulk, so far from the edges, then the real part and the imaginary part, we scale by square root log n, converges to a normal distribution uh, with variance one. And uh, you can see that the real part and the imaginary part are independent. Now you can do the same, but taking E, which is uh, close to the edge. So okay, let's look at the regime where E is close to B. Um, so it's of the form B minus N to the negative alpha, uh, where alpha is some uh, positive number. Then what you expect is that there is a transition when alpha is of order, start being uh, larger than two thirds because n to the negative two thirds is the typical distance between eigenvalues close to the edge. So, okay, here is the result. We have again a, a joint CLT where the, the real part and the imaginary part are independent. Uh, one additional thing is that you have to recenter uh, the real parts by some, uh, some uh, log, log n uh, term. Uh, close to the edge. And if you do so, so you get two uh, different variances that depend on alpha. And uh, okay, the variance is smaller and smaller when you get close to the edge. And once alpha reach the value, the value two thirds, the variance just uh, stays constant. So for the real part, it, it's, it takes the value two thirds. And for the imaginary part, at the edge, uh, the variance is just zero. So actually, you, we have, if you want, exactly at the edge, we have no central limit theorem for the imaginary part at the scale square root log n. And uh, that's uh, uh, normal because uh, the, the imaginary part is related to particle locations. And uh, particle fluctuations at the edge uh, are not Gaussian, actually. They are given by Tracy Widom. So you cannot prove, a, so even if you change the scaling here, you cannot prove a, a central limit theorem for the imaginary part of the log at the edge. Okay, so that's it for the CLT at one point, and then you can take uh, two points, actually. Okay, we can take as many points as, as we want, but uh, let's take two points. Um, if uh, the distance between your, your two points is uh, going to zero as uh, n to the negative alpha. So 
log of your distance divided by log n converges to some alpha, then the correlation will be alpha, up to some saturation, of course. Uh, if alpha is larger than one, then uh, just the two, the, the logarithmic polynomial, the characteristic polynomial at E1 and the characteristic polynomial at E2 are just fully correlated. So we see the, the logarithmic correlation. The correlation alpha is, is given by the log of the distance between the points uh, with a saturation effect at, uh, at scale one over n. Okay, uh, so this was for the real part. Exactly the same results holds for the, the imaginary part. And uh, we have uh, independence between the real part and the imaginary part. This is uh, always true. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, near the edge, so I'm not stating it uh, precisely, but uh, roughly speaking, um, the behavior is different for between the real part and the imaginary part. For the real part, uh, it's uh, similar to, to here. So the correlation are, are given by the limit of the log of the distance divided by log n. Uh, and of course, there is a saturation effect, which is not necessarily at one because the variance of the, the variance is not necessarily one. It can be something between two thirds and one. And you have the saturation effect when you reach the, when you are fully correlated and you reach the variance of the, the two uh, quantities. And uh, okay, interestingly, for the imaginary part, uh, the correlation are, are different and they are actually weaker. Uh, as soon as, uh, as your points the distance between your two points is uh, larger than the distance to the edge. Uh, there are no correlations. Okay, the correlations uh, only appear if your two points are, uh, the distance between the two points is smaller than the distance to the edge. Okay, so that's it for, for, uh, uh, for this result. Um, okay. Um, so f f some some uh, nice uh, corollary is uh, that I, I said that the imaginary part of the logarithm is uh, is uh, the counting function for eigenvalues. So if you define gamma k, so at each uh, for a given n, you define the gamma k to be the where you expect the particles to be. So it's given by the quantiles of the equilibrium measure. So, so the classical, the location where you expect, uh, gamma k is the location where you expect lambda k to be. Then you can look at the fluctuation of lambda k around its uh, classical location gamma k. And um, actually the, this quantity, so you have to rescale by uh, n over square root log n. So the typical fluctuation of uh, an eigenvalue is of order square root log n over n in the bulk. And then close to the edge, you have this factor here, which plays a role. Uh, this quantity satisfies exactly the same CLT as uh, the imaginary part of the uh, log of the characteristic polynomial. Okay, so you just have to transfer all the results, but you can take uh, Join convergence uh, in the ball close to the edge. Uh, okay. So now let, let me discuss what so the, the what was known before on this topic. So okay, I will omit uh, many many words, but uh, okay, at least. Concerning the cases that are particular cases of, of a general bit ensemble, there is the GUE. So Gustafsson proved uh, in, uh, uh, in 2005 uh, for the GUE, uh, the result for the imaginary part. So the, the full result close to the edge uh, in the bulk. So it was stated in terms of particles locations, actually. Um, 
but that's exactly the same as uh, the imaginary part. Uh, then it was extended to GOE and uh, GSE uh, by O'Rourke and uh, to Wigner matrices by uh, Tao Wenbu. And then for the real part, um, there, were, there is a, a result by uh, Krasowski for uh, uh, the GUE, where, uh, okay, the, it's a central limit theorem. You can take several values of E, but that are fixed. So you cannot see the, the log correlations uh, in this result. Uh, then there, are, there have been a result by uh, uh, Tao and Wu, which works for all the Gaussian beta ensembles, but only at E equals zero. And it works also for Wigner matrices. And uh, then there is a result by uh, uh, Paul and, Krish and Krishnan where um, they state that if we know the results, actually it's, it's working both for the imaginary part and the real part, but if you know the result for uh, GUE or GOE, you can transfer it to Wigner matrices. So now the result is known for GOE because it's a particular case of uh, our theorem. So uh, it can be extended to Victor matrices. Okay, and finally, the two most relevant uh, uh, papers for, 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 for this talk would be, uh, so there are two papers who uh, also studied the characteristic polynomial of Gaussian beta ensembles uh, recently. So the first one, so actually there are two of them uh, by uh, Lambert and, and Paquette both in 2020, there are two papers. Um, they study, so the, the method used by, in these papers is uh, that the characteristic polynomial, because of the three diagonal representation of Gaussian beta ensembles, it satisfies a recursion. So all the purpose of these papers is to study carefully this uh, recursion to get to deduce results on the characteristic polynomial. Um, the results of uh, Lambert and Paquette, they prove the convergence of the characteristic polynomial to, um, to um, an analytic function, uh, either on the upper half plane far enough from the, 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 the spectrum, or also close to the edge in the second paper. And in particular, this result close to the edge uh, implies the central limit theorem uh, at the edge. And then there is another paper by Audrey, uh, it is in uh, Zaytuni, uh, where they prove the central limit theorem, the same central limit theorem for Gaussian beta ensembles, but also for other three diagonal uh, models, which are not contained in, a, in, a, in our framework. They prove a central limit theorem uh, in the bulk uh, at one point. Okay, so that's it for the the literature, of course, I'm uh, omitting many results, for example, on uh, circular uh, ensembles that have been discussed by, uh, by Paul. Um, and also in dimension two, there are uh, results, not for, the, not for the characteristic polynomial yet, but there are uh, hints that uh, it's logarithmically correlated uh, in dimension two. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, how do we prove this uh, result? The main tool is uh, to prove a strong local law. So what is a local law? Uh, a local law is a, a result on the Stilges transform uh, of our model. So the Stilges transform um, of a measure is the integral, again, this measure of uh, the function one over lambda minus z for some z in the complex plane. And, um, okay, the, this still just transform, if you know it for any z, it contains the, you know, all the characterize the, the measure. So for example, the, the law of large number can be written as for any fixed z, uh, the still just transform of the empirical measure at step n converges to the still just transform of the equilibrium measure. A local law, uh, consists in proving that these two quantities are closed, even if you take uh, Z, which is uh, 
closer and closer to the, the real axis as uh, n goes to infinity. And moreover, you, the, the goal is to have some bound, which is this one. So to estimate the, the rate of convergence, the rate of convergence depends on eta. And it should be one over n eta. Uh, if you think about it, so, OK, you cannot really get better than this. Because if uh, lambda k, if you take z very close to the axis, and you take lambda k, which is exactly below uh, z, then the contribution of lambda k in this uh, sum is 1 over n eta. So the fact that lambda k can uh, fluctuate uh, around its position makes that uh, okay, each, the, the position of uh, just one particle is already contributing uh, at uh, this level. So this is uh, what we can hope, uh, the best we can hope. OK. Um, <clears throat> So the bound is uh, worse and worse when eta is uh, smaller and, and smaller. So here uh, these are two pictures. So here, if eta is n to the negative one quarter, you see that okay, the, the two functions are almost the same. But if uh, if you take eta smaller and smaller, you can start uh, to seeing the the fluctuations uh, of the of s of z. And uh, of course, uh, if you take eta, which is n, uh, 1 over n, then the fluctuations here start to be of order 1. There is no convergence at all. Uh, because really, uh, 1 over n is the scale where you have the positions, uh, so the distance between particles in the bulk. So uh, yeah, here, uh, at this scale, there is no hope to have a convergence uh, of, uh, of the Stilgest transform uh, to the, the equilibrium Stilgest transform. OK, so our, uh, the previous known result was the following. Um, uh, it has, so for Gaussian beta ensembles, so there are also many other uh, uh, local load that, that are known for, for many models. But uh, okay, this one is the, the one the most related to our model by Soso and Wong. Um, the difference between uh, S, uh, S of Z and the equilibrium uh, still just transform is of order n to the epsilon to the over n eta with overwhelming probability. Okay. Actually, to prove the, the central limit theorem for the characteristic polynomial, we need to get rid of this n to the epsilon. So that, that's what, what we do. We prove the, the following results. So, okay, there are uh, some uh, some conditions. The condition is just saying that uh, you take a point which is in a, a trapezoid region like this, above the, the interval a b. For any point in this uh, trapezoid region, we can bound all the moments of s minus uh, m equilibrium. Uh, the moment of order q is of order one over n eta to the q, so that's the optimal level. And also, we have the dependence of the constant uh, in terms of q. Okay. So this is true in the trapezoid region. Uh, outside the trapezoid region, uh, the, we can still have uh, results. But uh, okay, just the constant is, uh, is worse than this in terms of q. Um, Another comment is that uh, these results and also the results of, uh, outside the trapezoid region implies a rigidity for the eigenvalues at the optimal scale, which is uh, log n over n. So the probability that uh, any uh, particle is much further than a large constant time log n over n from its classical location, uh, this uh, probability is uh, very small smaller than uh, any polynomial if we take the constant large in. Okay, so this improves the previous result uh, of, uh, by Bogard and Erdoshiao for rigidity for this ensemble. Okay. And by the way, we, we don't use their results. So that's an alternative proof of rigidity. If you want. Um, finally, I just want to mention that uh, such a sharp uh, local law has 
uh, already been proved for Wigner matrices by uh, Kacha, Purity, Maltsev, and Schlein. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> that's it for, for the, the result. Now I, I want to discuss the proof. Um, first, the proof of the local law. So uh, um, the proof of the local law actually is uh, relatively, uh, relatively simple, especially for Gaussian beta ensembles. So I will focus on Gaussian beta ensembles. For general beta ensembles, there, there is uh, one additional uh, difficulty, uh, but I, I won't mention it. Okay, so what's the what's the idea? For general beta ensembles, uh, for Gaussian beta ensembles, um, the Stilges transform of the semicircle distribution, which is the equilibrium measure, satisfies a quadratic equation, which is the following: m squared plus z m plus one is equal to zero. And so the idea is to prove that S of Z, which is the Stilges transform of the empirical measure, satisfies approximately the same equation. So Z squared plus ZS plus one is small in absolute value. To do this, we, we will use loop equations. But once this is known, then uh, you can bound uh, if you know that S satisfies the same equ uh, equation as M, then you can prove that S is close to M, at least in the trapezoid region. Okay. That's where the trapezoid region is coming from. But just that the quadratic uh, equation has two solutions. And uh, one thing to do is to identify if you are close to this solution or to the other solution. And this is uh, okay, easy to do in the trapezoid region just because the fact of knowing that uh, both quantities have a positive imaginary part is enough to identify the, which solution is the correct one. Okay, so now uh, the main goal is to bound moments of z squared plus zs plus one um, using loop equations. So, okay, what are loop equations? Um, so there are many forms of uh, loop equations that appear uh, in many different contexts. Uh, it's always uh, written as an exact formula between different moments at finite n. And uh, okay, we have seen a loop equation in 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 Paul uh, in Paul Stoke. Here they are slightly different, but uh, still related. Um, and um, okay, they, okay, they I put two two papers, uh, which are the ones where uh, where loop equations with a form close to to the one we are using are appearing. So this is a physics paper uh, by Chekhov and Ena, and then there is a paper by Borou and Guillonet, where the same uh, loop equations appear, but for cumulants of uh, S instead of uh, moments of S. Okay, the first loop equation is relatively nice. You see already the polynomial which appear s squared plus zs plus one, and it's uh, the moment of this is equal to this quantity. So if you just look at this first loop equation, uh, fact is that uh, the derivative of s prime can be bounded by the imaginary part of s where it's eta. And the imaginary part of s, okay, you can accept that it uh, should be of a finite order, the same order as, as the imaginary part of uh, m equilibrium. So this quantity S prime should be of order one over eta. So you already see that this first loop equation tells us this polynomial is of order one over n. Of course, it's not so simple because there are no absolute values here, but that's the idea. And uh, if we take higher power, we expect to have a higher power of one over n. Okay. So then these are really the loop equations we are looking at. We introduce spectator variables, z1 to zn. And uh, we look at the same quantity, so the, the polynomial, uh, the, the same polynomial, but now it's multiplied by uh, the value of s at different spectator variables. If you do so, there is again a loop equation, which gives that uh, this is equal to the same term as before where you add the product of the 
of the, involving the spectator variables. And there is an additional term, which is the sum over the spectator variables of the derivative with, with respect to their position. Okay. Whatever uh, it is, what do we do? How do we choose our spectator variables? Uh, we just choose them to be uh, k of them to be equal to z and l of them to be equal to z bar. So from now on, everything is uh, evaluated at z. So I will write just s for s of z and s bar for s of z bar, which is s of z bar. So you can enter the, the, the conjugation inside the Stilges transform. So if you just plug in uh, the same, uh, the, the, these values inside the previous loop equation, you end up with this loop equation. So the expectation of all polynomial multiplied by any powers of S or S bar can be expressed in the terms of uh, uh, some uh, terms, which will be of, uh, not of small order, but they, they, they contain some uh, order of times of size one over n eta here, one over n square eta square here, times some uh, the same powers of S and S bar. Okay. So that's uh, just a way to rewrite the loop equations. Then how do we use them? Um, so that's the formula uh, which, which was just before. The idea which comes from, uh, has been used in a paper by uh, Lee and, and Schnelli is the following. You, what we want is to bound the moments of, of this polynomial. Um, so rewrite them as once the polynomial times uh, the other part. And this old blue thing, we can expand it. I mean, that's just a, a huge product. And if you expand it, each term will, which will just involve some s to the k, s bar to the l, and, uh, and maybe factors of z and z bar. So you can apply this formula to each term that you get, and you get this. So you, for example, for s prime, uh, you just recover exactly the same thing. And uh, for these terms, actually, uh, it involves a derivative of the, this polynomial. Okay, so what can we say for, from this? We bound the two, Q, the two Q moments of the polynomial by uh, expectations involving smaller moments of the polynomial. This, here it's the polynomial to the two Q minus one. Here is the polynomial to the two Q minus two. So then what we do is just we apply to each term, we apply a, a young inequality. So to, to the product, we, we, we take this as a y and everything else as x. And uh, we choose the power in the young inequality to recover a moment to the 2q of the polynomial. So for example, for, for this term here, um, this term, so the, the first term here, uh, okay, it's bounded by this. Um, we just put the polynomial here to the power 2q. We just take care to have some prefactors so that uh, this term can be included on the left hand side here. And then we get uh, a term where we will be able to say that it's small. Okay, if we do that for each term, uh, we and also we bound uh, so s prime. I already said that s prime was roughly speaking upside, so it can be bounded by the imaginary part of s over eta, and s second can be bounded by the imaginary part of s over eta square. If you just plug in everything, you apply Young inequality, you get this bound. This polynomial is bounded by what we want, okay, times uh, the imaginary part of s. Uh, and so something involving S, but which will, which we hope to be of constant order. So, okay, how do you conclude from here? Then it's relatively easy, uh, at least in the bulk. You just, in the bulk, you have really, uh, you can bound the distance between S and the, uh, the Stilges transform of the equilibrium measure by the absolute value of this, uh, this polynomial. So this bound, if you, you replace S by uh, M equilibrium by applying uh, triangle, the triangle inequality, 
and uh, okay, you get this bound. So if this term here is smaller than one, then you can include this term on the left hand side, and you get uh, the local. Okay. Um, so really, for Gaussian beta ensembles, uh, nothing was uh, hidden. So that's really the proof. At least in the, in the book. So okay, then there are some discussions uh, a bit closer to the edge, but. Uh, that, that's it. That's, uh, I mean, you can write it as a two-page proof once the, the loop equations are, are given. Okay, so how, when, am, when am I supposed to stop? So you have like uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so that, that's it for, for the for the proof of the local law. Um, now, how do we get the central limit theorem from the local law? Okay. There are two steps in the proof and which are really uh, complementary. The, the first step is to uh, regularize the log. So I said uh, at some point that uh, if you, if, if you take the central limit theorem proved by Johansson, but you just plug in uh, with f equal to the log in the, the variance, the variance is just infinite. And uh, I said that the truth should be given by a, a logarithm, which is regularized at, uh, at scale one over n. So that's what we want to do, the first step. We want to replace log of uh, the, the logarithm by the logarithm taken at a point slightly above the axis. So by doing this, uh, this function taken as a function of, uh, of uh, lambda is now uh, slightly smoother. At scale one over n, it's, uh, it's smooth. So what is eta? Eta is just some, okay, whatever, something uh, not too big over n. So slightly more than one over n, that's what we need. So in the bulk, of course, close to the edge, you have to, to adapt to the, this has to be always slightly larger than the distance between particles. Okay, then uh, we can prove that we can replace the uh, log of E minus lambda K by the log of E plus I eta minus lambda K. Um, okay. How do we prove this? You write uh, this difference between logs. It's you can write it as an integral of uh, one over e plus i u minus lambda k. And uh, okay, actually there is a term of order n which changes uh, in the, the law of large numbers. So you have to take it into account, and you end up with a uh, an integral containing the Stilges transform of the empirical measure minus the Stilges transform of the equilibrium measure. So what we need is the local law here. And actually we need another uh, result, which is uh, a control even on, on submicroscopic scale. So the local law is, is useful to go from a slightly less than one over N to slightly more than one over N. But really on very, very small scales, we need an argument to say, uh, Okay. With high priority, there is no one in a very, very short uh, uh, interval. Okay, and uh, so the new goal is now to prove that uh, the CLT, but for this uh, regularized log. Okay. Uh, it's important to say that, okay, we cannot go much further. Okay, we could change this function, which is a bit arbitrary, but we cannot go much further because uh, uh, here we would be stuck. And in the other one, if, if the function was not regularized as much as it is here, the other part of the argument would, would uh, fail. So there, there is really an equilibrium between the two parts. In this part, we cannot uh, regularize more. And in the other part, if it was less uh, regularized, the other part would, would fail. So what is the other part? It's uh, more or less, uh, the same as what uh, Paul presented uh, on, on the blackboard. So it's, uh, it's using loop equations again. 
Uh, it's a method uh, so which is close to the one used by uh, Johnson to prove uh, his central limit theorem. Uh, just instead of looking at the Laplace transform, as uh, in this paper, um, we look at the characteristic uh, function of the quantity we are, we are interested in. So this has been done, for example, in a paper by, by Bogad Erdoshiaoyin. So we want to study this uh, characteristic function. Um, and for this, we do a change of measure. So again, as, it, as in, uh, in Paul's uh, talk, uh, you define a new measure, uh, which has density exponential i theta uh, Sn of f with respect to p. Okay, here the, it's a slight abuse of notation to, to write with, with a p of priority because it's a complex measure, but uh, okay. Then, uh, if you, you look at uh, z prime of theta, you can see that it has to be i times z theta times the expectation under this new measure of Sn of f. So why is it useful to, to do this? Uh, it's really because this quantity is easier to, to compute that, than this quantity. Here, okay, we are on, under a modified measure, which is not so good, but we are computing the first moments of a linear statistic. So that's a relatively nice uh, quantity. Okay, if we are able to estimate this, well, then we will have an estimate for Z prime over Z. And from this, we can recover an estimate for Z. So how do we estimate this uh, expectation here? We use a uh, helfer formula. So this formula allows you to represent a, a function on the, the real line as an integral over the complex plane of some function g, which is obtained uh, in terms of f, but most importantly, times uh, one over x minus uh, w. Okay, it's a kind of a generalization of the Cauchy uh, integral formula, or okay, it's a type of, of green, uh, green formula. Uh, why do are we interested in this? Just because if we have this term, then the Stilges transform will appear. And if the Stilges transform uh, appears, we can apply uh, what we know about Stilges transform. Okay, so this uh, this Helfer-Sturston formula transforms this uh, quantity into this integral, where now we have to estimate the difference between S and M equilibrium. The only uh, Annoying thing is that it's not under uh, the, the usual measure, but it's under the, the modified measure. So how do we do this? We use loop equations. So we use only the, here, before we were using a whole hierarchy of uh, loop equations that's uh, involving many terms. Here we use only the first one, but under the measure P theta. It's written, uh, okay, a way to write it, which looks like the, the previous way, is this. So this is exactly the previous loop equation. Oops, sorry. But the fact of being under uh, this new measure makes that we have an additional term involving f, f prime. And that's, okay, that's really where the interesting things are coming up because, uh, so this term plays a non-trivial role. Okay, the, using the local law, that we can transfer to the local law is true under p, but it's also true under p theta, just because uh, the, the density here is bounded by one, so we can transfer the, the property. That's really the main advantage of taking the characteristic function and not the Laplace transform, is that we can transfer the, the properties from p to p theta. Uh, the local law uh, allows us to identify the main order in all of these terms. And it gives that this moment, the one we're interested in, can be written in terms of uh, this quantity. So the main, the, the main term will be this quantity, where we replace S by M equilibrium. And here also we replace this uh, integral by an integral over the equilibrium measure. Uh, so yeah, then you just plug, it, plug in this uh, 
inside the, this formula, you have to argue that all the remaining terms are, are negligible. And uh, that's it. Uh, it could be central limit. OK, so I, I, I'll stop here. OK, so thanks to Michel. Uh, so now uh, you can unmute yourself if you want to uh, thank uh, Michel for his talk. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, so you can also unmute yourself if you want to make uh, questions. So I have a question. So when you bound the, the moments, no? you get this uh, this constant q to the q. Yes. So I I, I don't remember if this is uh, uh, this is I think borderline to to know that um, uh, that the, let's say the the law is that it's, it's characterized by the moments, no? Um, so do, do you mean, is it important to have a, an exact uh, bound here in terms of Q? Let's you. No, I mean, I'm just curious because this is, it's, it, it's kind of the, it's, I, I, I don't remember if, if this bound is enough or just not enough. To, um... Oh, yes, I see. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it is. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think uh, this type of bond is enough. Yeah, it goes. Uh, it's, it's uh, okay. The, uh, actually, there are two, uh, if you notice it here, it's Q to the Q for the Q's moment. And in my proof, it was Q to the Q for the two Q moment. We have a better bond for a Gaussian beta ensemble. Okay, what does this bond mean? It means that. Uh, if you forget, if you rescale this by any eta, it means that this quantity multiplied by any eta has exponential moments. That's what it, it means. Okay. And, uh, that's exponential moments are the ones where you have uh, moments which are of the order q to the q. And uh, if you, if the, 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 so this characterizes the law in it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, in the, for Gaussian beta ensembles, actually, we have a, a Q over two. So here for the two Q moment, we have only Q. So it means that it has not, not only exponential moments, but also uh, Gaussian moments, this quantity yeah. here we scale. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Michel, is it important that you actually have Q to the Q or could you allow a worse constant depending on Q or? Okay, um, so it depends for, for what? Uh, for the central limit theorem, actually, we just need Q, which is a two. Yes, that I imagine, I mean, it's, yeah. So, okay, and so you don't care about the constant. Uh, where the constant is playing a role is that when you try to prove the rigidity, for example, oh, you, yes. you, you are gonna try uh, take a very high moments, uh, depending on the bond you try to reach. And uh, then, uh, because you take Q, which is diverging uh, with the scale you are looking at, you can optimize things and get better. For example, for the, the largest eigenvalue, we can prove that the priority is that the largest eigenvalue is uh, larger than B plus X times N to the negative two third. Uh, we can have really the, the, the tail in terms of X. Sure. And it's not actually it's not the optimal tail because we don't have probably because we don't have a, the the best moment possible. If we had better constant in Q, maybe we could really see the Tracy Widom tail. Actually, we cannot. Mm -hmm. So yes, this this moment plays a role, but more in uh, in side questions, not not for the central limit theorem. And and I have another uh, question, maybe. 
why uh, so in the non-gaussian case how do you do because then s of z doesn't satisfy an algebraic equation no uh it does <laughs> but okay ah, it does. Yeah, uh, in okay uh, that, that's a good question but there is a there is an additional term in the loop equation uh -huh. and this term uh okay the problem is that it's not written in terms of s uh, that's really the, the annoying part so here the good thing is that everything depends only on yes. s on s there is an, an additional term which is of the type uh, uh it's a uh, it's a linear statistic of a smooth function, actually, mm -hmm. uh, multiplied by, by this. So, it, okay, s prime of z, you should s s see that uh, it's just it's similar to this one, but you have s prime of z, which is re replaced by a, so s prime of z over n, which is replaced by a centered linear statistic. So, something which is of order one over n, if we are able to bond it. But again, you what we would like is to have all moments bound for all moments for this centered linear statistics, but we don't have it yet because, uh, okay. So that there is a, a, a kind of, uh, okay, it's an annoying term for, for sure. And there is a method which has already been used. Uh, yeah, you bootstrap them. I in, guess. Uh, no, no, it's not a bootstrap. Okay, th that's one thing you could probably do, but that's uh, just an integration uh, trick to, to get rid of, you, you, you look at appropriate in, uh, contour integrals and uh, all these terms are uh, non-analytic uh, on AB, ah. except the additional term. It's the only one. So when you do a contour integral, you can say, oh, this, the integral of this term is zero. Then you move your contour and you can write uh, your loop equation without this term. Uh, Actually, the proof of dealing with this term is longer than uh, the whole proof for the Gaussian beaton. So, sure. <laughs> but, uh, so that's where you use the, the condition V is, uh, is real analytic, I mean, for, for doing those control integral. Uh, uh, okay, even for writing this, uh, here Z is replaced by, by V prime of Z, for example. Sure, yeah, okay, I see. That's, uh, that's okay, uh, all these loop, loop equations, uh, you could do something if V was not analytic by doing some pseudo analytic expansion, but okay, really the way we use the loop equation, we there are derivative of V uh, everywhere on the complex plane. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay. okay, thanks. So there is a question on the chat, but uh, probably you already. Uh, yes, that's more or more or less what. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, right. uh, uh, yes, so for beta ensemble, uh, okay, the proof here, uh, there is one more term, and uh, which is okay, relatively annoying, but uh, uh, okay, and then for the central limit theorem, uh, it's really similar. Just, uh, okay. Uh, so, yeah. so if uh, there are no more questions, let's uh, thank uh, Michel and uh, also Paul for these uh, two uh, wonderful lectures. Thank you.